I spent almost my career in a private sector until Prime Minister Abe asked me to come back home to run the government pension fund. So uh, it was kind of like a challenge for me to go into the public sector and where there are so many uh, regulation and unwritten rules that really dictate what the, I can do even as an investment chief of the fund. But I just realized the, uh, the sometimes uh, having capacity to work with the, uh, the policy makers will really assist even a portfolio manager like a pension fund investor. And then, so uh, I think the, uh, there's no like, uh, well, there's sort of tension, but uh, the, uh, the bringing in the public sector policy maker to kind of like a guardrail what the, uh, the professional can, uh, you know, they're trying to push their innovation is very important. Um, I think the, well, I never lobbied for Tesla, by the way, but the, uh, I think I try to uh, persuade the Japanese government to set the policy to shift the auto industry into electricity. And then, as you can imagine, there's so the much- That is the definition of lobbying. Yeah, experience. well, <laughs> I didn't do it for Tesla, but I did it for the future of, the, sure. of humanity, sure. okay? Sure. That's a big difference. Sure. But right. what I'm saying is like, uh, you know, the government, well, let me put that this way. You know, when the Japan had the amazing growth after World War II, mm -hmm. everybody questioned what was the key success factor. And everybody says it's METI, Ministry of Economy, and Trade and Industry, who set the industry policy so that the Japanese industry can work together collectively to achieve economic growth, which was true. But the problem now is everybody still complain METI now doesn't have a vision. But my argument is, they cannot have a vision because the private sector is so advanced and they are competing to prove they are right or wrong. And in that case, it's not like, like 50 years ago, everybody know how to grow your industry or how to grow your economy. Now, nobody knows. So I think that what the other public sector or policymaker can possibly do is they actually create the safe sandbox or playground for the other innovative private sector company to do their best to prove what is wrong, what is right, what is wrong, rather than the policymaker try to set their own scenario and then they promote their industry. That's not gonna work anymore. So I think that what, the, for example, like Dubai is doing is pretty much you know, the good example of the other, what the government can do. You know, the, you're not writing why, where, what, what the, our future is. Not from the you know, humanity perspective, but from technology perspective. But you allow the other uh, technology company to work at the, their best and competing at the fastest speed. So uh, I think the other, what the public policy makers should be doing is just to make sure first, uh, when they are trying something, you have to safeguard them, not miss, you know, unconsciously, you know, breach rules and et cetera. And the second is from the investor's perspective, you know, I've been trying to promote the other zero emission economy, but the problem is everybody's still No, absolutely. I'm going to get to sustainability, and I suppose the answer to that is to ensure the global sustainability. We need to ensure the sustainability of governments themselves, because uh, especially in democracies, and this is not a criticism, but more like a fact, they seem to be thinking only in four-year terms. Um, uh, but... Um, uh, I'm with you on that. Um, I think the UAE has been uh, avant-garde in starting, um, I think, the world's first artificial intelligence ministry. Um, I know in Japan, uh, you said the, in the past that uh, the success story was, was built by the Ministry of uh, Economy and Trade and Investment. Um, I know you started the Ministry of Digital Transformation, uh, where I'm a very big fan of Mr. Kono, uh, who's doing a, a remarkable uh, job. Um, he's, of course, a previous foreign minister and a previous defense minister. Um, uh, as I said, we launched a Japanese edition, and uh, when I went for the first time in 2019, um, I was a little bit surprised because Japan in the 90s, in our minds at least, was very much technology advanced, um, but seems that there's a lot of work to be done to catch up. Um, but to do that, people need to be convinced, as you rightly said, with sustainability. Now, um, I, may I say also that the pensions fund you managed for Japan is the world's biggest. So, um, and you sit on the board of several multinationals. 
You've recently argued in a Financial Times article that sustainability uh, is increasingly seen as the as a core should be increasingly seen as a core corporate policy, and I think this is where you hit the nail uh, on the head. Most companies, um, just like governments who are looking and thinking of the next election, most companies are thinking of immediate profits, mm -hmm. not sustainability. So. Uh, how do we strike the right balance or, and I agree with you that it's not lobbying for the sake of Tesla, but for the sake of humanity. Um, we've all seen what happens when you focus on the immediate, on the now, and for, uh, forgive the, uh, foresee the future, and not foresee the future. So how do you strike the right balance and how do you convince, whether it's corporates, the corporations, or governments? Well, the corporation, by definition, has to have a bit shorter, you know, the time frame because they need to continuously satisfy the stock market. But the government doesn't have to worry about that kind of like a short term, like the other performance. So that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, first of all, government have to set the policy so that the company can adjust their strategy. And then when the company adjusts their strategy to the other government long-term policy, investors should look at that from that perspective. What's going on right now is, you know, the, uh, the investor really cannot have a long-term view because, as I said, the democracy is continuously changing the, uh, the, the policies on the climate, for example. So this one, I think the, uh, the uh, investors and the business the short-termism uh, is historically, theoretically shouldn't exist because, the, uh, the, you know, the stock market, they should price the company stock today as a present value of future cash flow. And then the future cash flow should go like a 20, 30 years because the company meant to be going concern. But the why people are so much concerned about the next quarter and the next the, the quarter after next is people just don't know where that this you know, the business is going. So uh, I think that is a probably the most important things government really have to show. This is the this is where our future is. And the second point I want to make is you know even in the U.S. and a democracy, it's hard to have a long-term strategy. But they should not politicize something affect our future and our humanity for a long time, like a climate change. You know, the other, it's, I, I, I do agree. There's a lot of things that the policy should, you know, there's a lot of politicization kicks into the place. And I really don't think like a no politicization is, a, is, is ideal. Sometimes it's, it's good to have a good politicization. But we need to keep the other, something like a climate change. It's a kind of like a out of the politicization because we cannot change the climate policy every four years, right? So uh, we just need to find a way, like the, in the democratic you know, decision-making process, we just need to set aside this agenda. We're not going to politicize. <laughs> this is something you know, which should be bipartisan. Whatever the people in the, in the power have to follow this. And then without that, every four years, we need to start questioning whether global, we are, we are warming up or kind of freezing up. I don't know. But. Well, um, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but if we are at a point where we can't figure out what's a man and what's a woman, and if a person can identify as a cat, I think we have a long way to go in countries, in certain countries like the United States. But let me continue with the aspect of sustainability. Um, Actually, similarly, you argue in that same Financial Times uh, article that MBAs around the world are actually failing to update their business education program to, su to suit their inc this increasing priority. Uh, how can then government institutions more uh, finally prepare their youth for more sustainable focused government strategies, especially in this climate of uh, ultra uh, politicization, which to be fair isn't just happening in the US, it's something that's now happening across many countries around the world. Mm. Well, I've been criticizing the other, I mean, all the leading business schools. Uh, I graduated almost like 30 years ago, and then the, the most of the curriculum hasn't changed at all. Uh, while the other uh, business is really changing, and then uh, sustainability and uh, climate change was not even the agenda like uh, 20 years ago, but now in the uh, CEOs, you know, the border and the boardrooms, they talk. They cannot spend a day without talking about sustainability. But why it cannot be reflected in the other uh, uh, leadership education like MBA? It yeah. is because first of all, government and the private sector is holding their information and doesn't facilitate a lot of academic and scientific research uh, on these issues. And then once the academic research is made, uh, you know, the teacher feel confident to teach them to the students. 
But as when I, every time, you know, I, I'm, on a bus, I'm a visiting faculty of Harvard Oxford School, Cambridge, and where I always argue they should reflect the, these new reality of climate change and sustainability into the, the you know, teaching curriculum. The most common pushback is saying that there's no enough academic research to prove, have a theory to teach. So uh, I think that what the government institution can do is they could assist the academic institution or they bring in the private partnership uh, partners to share their information and their experiences so that the, uh, the academic and science researcher can work on it. And once they work on the data and information and come up with the theory, they can teach to the students. So uh, one of the points I'd like to make to conclude my point is that the, all the educational institution in the UAE or in the US and Japan or wherever, ask them how many of their curriculum has ever changed by ref uh, to reflect you know, these new upcoming issues like climate change. Very few. So uh, and the, inst uh, the government institution, do they have an intention to help those academic institutions to work on those agenda? Probably very few too. So uh, I think the, uh, the UAE pretty much took only one year to educate a whole nation that the climate change is an important agenda. <laughs> All right, so the, it's maybe not that easy in the, some democratic countries, but the, uh, the, we really need to make sure that everybody is on the same page and the stop debating on the sustainability importance or not. And once we agree it's important, we could come up with a theory and we can have a theory, we can teach them, and we can come up with a reaction. And that's really missing, but that's what the government can really start uh, absolutely. taking Diana, first action. And I want to reiterate that you know all political systems have their advantages and uh, disadvantages, and democracies certainly do. I want to turn back to you, Mr. Uh, Mizuno, or shall I say Mr. ESG? So it's one of your many titles. You're right. known to be a champion uh, for ESG. And this is why my next question is very important. Um, at a time with rising prices, we've seen prices surge um, due to shortage of supply and the pandemic uh, due to the Ukraine war, for example. Uh, we've seen countries that have traditionally been preaching uh, ESG, mm -hmm. religiously preaching ESG, such as Germany turned to coal. Mm -hmm. So um, is it... Is ESG dying as a concept or importance? Uh, or, um, and don't you think it's a little bit, um, I don't want to say um, hypocritical, but convenient to use it when times are good and to forget about it when times are bad? Yeah. Well, it's meant to be used more in uh, bad times <laughs> because the, uh, the ESG was finally, well, I was among people who started the you know, ESG advocacy in the investment industry. Uh, I started believing all the conventional financial analysis and the financial decision-making process only takes that the, the financial and the short-term, you know, the numbers into their analysis and decision-making. That actually, the, uh, the you know, uh, created a collective era of the market where everybody trying to pursue better performance. At the end of the day, people, you know, just create more and more pollution, more on the bad social impact. So the ESG was initially developed. When you look at all those financial numbers to make a decision, just to pay attention to other known, you know, known, known quantitative information to make sure you're not actually putting the money to, to do harm on the society, to do harm on the environment. But as that it became mainstream, uh, financial industry always looking for the way to use it more technically. So they started asking for where's the data, where's the formula, where's the, the algorithm. And that's where they started seeing, like, oh, ESG may not be working. And the other issue you raised is like a lot of people started using ESG as a kind of like marketing, marketing like a performance. Yes. Uh, and in the Europe, people have started thinking about the ESG washing is prevailing. So the uh, let's stop ESG. But I always say like ESG, talking about ESG washing or green washing, it's better than not washed. <laughs> yes, true. that's true. Right, so uh, the, it's better than not washed. <laughs> it was not washed in the first place, now it's washed. But the point is we need to wash it very cleanly, right? So the, uh, I think the ESG is dying, I don't believe so, but the, uh, the initial concept of ESG, which is when you make an investment, when you start a business, just don't focus only on the short-term performance of the business also pay attention to their impact on the society and also the environment. So that's meant to be more like what I call like a, a hygiene factor for the investment. So 
as, that, as a hygiene factor, I think the ESG will remain and made a huge impact. I mean, when we are discussing about the, the Tesla's ESG score being too low, I always think like, you know, methodology has, still has a lot of limitation. But at the same time, remember the, uh, the you know, SpaceX provided like, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Interlink to Ukraine. How many like a corporate CEO followed by providing services and uh, stopping the work with the Russian? And before ESG movement, that didn't happen, wouldn't have happened. Because they, uh, a lot of people tend to forget, but just 10 years ago, it was just not done thing, or CEO not meant to make a statement about social issue. But now, if they don't do it, people criticize and, and the market punishes them. So uh, it's just a move, whole movement of like a making the corporate more socially responsible is uh, actually like, you know, elastic by the ESG investment. But ESG investment is just one aspect of the other. We are just trying to make the other businesses and the capital market more responsible. So, um, like your company's name, if I were to ask you to be a good steward mm. and point us in the right direction to which corporation or which uh, government that you think is an ideal model uh, to follow. Uh, it is very difficult to answer the question to answer, which is ideal, because every government has their own limitation. Uh, What's your favorite? Should I say UAE? <laughs> If it is, do please very, do. Very good job, to be yes. honest. But on the other hand, there are some aspects that I prefer, pr probably prefer the other system. Okay. So I think the other, there's no, you know, one fits all type of answers in terms of the, co you know, the governance of the nation or country. But uh, every people have to make sure that the other, they work for the citizens and they actually take care of the other common good. And the climate change is a great example. It will benefit everybody. <laughs> And I always say, there's only one climate. <laughs> Whatever the, each country does, at the end of the day, there's only one climate, right? So they, they should foster a lot of the like, global collaboration. So I'm trying to dodge the question a little bit. No, no, but fine, fine. I really think any government who can step up to read the conversation on a collaborative effort to prevent global warming, that is a very good opportunity. Because we try to work, I mean, I, as a UN Special Envoy, I try to promote global collaboration. And in many cases, it fail, fails. But I think the climate is one thing, probably easier for everybody to agree uh, to starting on the other one initiative. And I will rate that government who stepped out and decided to take a leadership as my template. <laughs>